Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for what we remember this day. And thank you for just how much you love us. Father, as we prepare to share from your word, I pray that the seed of your word will find good soil to germinate in soil that will produce effect and fruit. Father, even on this day, we still need a word from you. Even in this time, we still need to hear from you. So Holy Spirit, speak. We destroy every work of the enemy. Satan, the blood of Jesus is still against you. We simply declare the Lord rebuke you. Father, at the end of the day, I'm nothing but a lump of clay. So help me by the power of your Holy Spirit to be effective for your glory's sake. And in Jesus' name, amen. Um, you hear this often. Preachers would say, I feel this is an important message. And I feel this is an important message. And I also felt last week's was an important message. And last year's Good Friday message was important. Um, but this message is very important because I think some of us could relate to what we are talking about today. We are going to glean from the Gospel of Luke chapter 23 uh, from verse 50 to 56. And it says, Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man. He had not consented to their decision and deed. He was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock, where no one had ever lain before. That day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew near. And the woman who had come with him from Galilee followed after and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. And our main passage is verse 56, where it says, Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Our topic is when God seems unavailable I don't know if you've ever been there and I if you keep living you will come to a point where you feel like you are calling and you're not even getting a voicemail when you call heaven not even a call back not even one of those automatic uh, text messages that people send back call you back or I'm on the phone when God seems unavailable the events in the life of Christ reveal that we serve a God who allows certain things to happen for a certain period, for certain reasons. God allows certain things to prepare us for what is coming. If you read the passage in the gospel accounts, you would find that there is a feeling, a sense of urgency in the events that happened before Jesus went to Calvary. He shows up to Jerusalem on Sunday. Monday, he turns over the tables in the temple and he gets the attention of the Sanhedrin council. By Tuesday, they have decided to kill him. By Wednesday, they find a co-conspirator named Judas. By Thursday, he is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's arrested around 9 p.m. and by 3 p.m. on Friday, he's dead. All that happens in about 18 hours. In 18 hours, the 72 member Sanhedrin council is convened at night, which is illegal. But also, you know, nobody gets anybody out of their house to show up at that time at night if they don't have to. So they gather, they conspire, and they convict Jesus on a charge they know he's not guilty of. Then they drag him to Pilate's house. All at night. Pilate doesn't give a verdict. So they take him to Herod, who also does not give a verdict, and they take him back to Pilate. All of this between midnight and 6 a.m. By 6 a.m., a crowd has now gathered outside of Pilate's house. 
And the Sanhedrin council has now found people who they've paid to show up at 6 a.m. to lie on Jesus. These people show up. They lie. Pilate convicts him on the charge he knows he is not guilty of. Jesus is beaten. He's stripped. He's forced to carry a 120-pound cross through Jerusalem up the mountainside of Golgotha. And within 18 hours, he's nailed on a cross to be crucified. Why the rush? Why the hurry to get Jesus on the cross? The answer is that because by sunset, Passover begins. By the way, let me say this. This is a unique year because it just so happens that this very day today, April uh, what, 15th, by sunset, Passover actually begins. And so this is significant for us as believers because I have, and I've taught this and we believe it, that when, when the, the biblical feast happens, the portals of heaven are open in a special way. So this is a season to experience God in a special way. Where, where Good Friday and actual Passover, Passover lines up. And so, so they got to get him on that cross. They got to get him uh, all, all, all buried before sunset happens. Because Sabbath or this Passover is a Sabbath day, a high Sabbath. A holy day. And they know that they can't crucify Christ during Passover celebration. If they don't get him on the cross before sunset, all the thousands of Jews who came to Jerusalem will leave and go back. And then the Pharisees would have missed their opportunity to publicly crucify Christ in the presence of so many so that they can go home and tell folks that the Jesus thing is over. There was a rush to get Jesus on the cross so that the Jesus move can be done and over with. So he's on the cross by noon, by 3 p.m. he's dead, and the rush continues. A member of the Sanhedrin council named Joseph, who is from the city of Arimathea, he goes to Pilate and he asks permission to get the body of Jesus. He's raised, re rushing against the sun. He needs to get Jesus off the cross, wrapped up, and the tomb sealed before the sun goes down, because the Jews were prohibited from doing work. On the Sabbath. If he does not succeed, Jesus' body will possibly get burned by the Roman authorities. So Joseph is hurrying, and the Bible says there were some women who had followed Jesus all the way from Galilee. There were some women who had followed Jesus all the way from Galilee. Aren't you glad for the faithfulness of women? who followed Jesus all the way from Galilee. These women were with him from the beginning. So there was Mary, his mother. There was Mary Magdalene. You know, she loved him so much that she poured oil, expensive oil on his feet and washed it and, and, and dried it with her hair. That's the kind of women that followed him, devoted, passionate women. There was Mary and Martha. They, they loved Jesus, and, and, and I believe maybe Jairus' daughter was there, and maybe the woman with the issue of blood was there, and maybe the woman from the well at Samaria was there, maybe even Peter's mother-in-law was there. There were some women, the Bible says, who, who followed him. I wonder if the bent-over woman had showed up. Many of the, the women who, who Jesus blessed is now following Joseph as he buries the body. But I want, I want you to note in the passage, they are following behind a dead body. For, for them, it's, it, it, it's not over. They, they, they must have found it hard to accept that it ended like this. They must have had a hard time processing how things went so bad, so quick. Sometimes in life, you will find yourself following behind a dead thing, hoping you can do one more thing to save it. They are following because they want to anoint his body properly. Problem. Or somebody said last night, plot twist. The sun goes down. And the laws of Sabbath now blocks them from doing more. And all they can do is watch him buried. 
Watch their miracle worker be buried. Watch their way maker be buried. Watch their healer be buried. Watch their hopes be buried. Their heart wants to do more, but all they can do is watch him be buried. Can I tell you that sometimes life and even God will sometimes have you in a place where all you can do is watch that thing be buried. Sometimes it feels like God is unavailable. Sometimes you will feel like there is nothing you can do. Your hands are tied. Your last move has been made. You've got no more options. You've got no more tricks up your sleeves. No more, pl uh, no more pleas that you can make. There is no more I am sorry. Sometimes the time runs out on the clock. And it is hard to stand and watch something be buried that you hoped you could save. When you don't know what else to do, what do you do? Well, these sisters teach us what we ought to do. Here are some points. When God seems unavailable, point number one, prepare for next. When God seems unavailable, prepare for next. The Bible says they went home and they prepared oils and spices and they don't sit sorrowfully and sad looking pathetic and wallowing in their pity and their pain they begin to prepare oils and spices because somehow they believed that they'll see even if it's his body again you don't prepare for what has happened you prepare for what is to come you prepare when you believe something is about to happen. So when you don't know what else to do, start believing in your heart that no matter how bad it gets, no matter how much you are suffering, God is not finished yet. God has another chapter that he needs you to prepare for. God is not finished with us yet. God has more he wants to do in us and through us and for us. And God is saying to us on this Good Friday, prepare, believe that the story is not ended. I will do something else. I may not know how. We may not know how he's going to do it. We may not know when he's going to do it. But we got to be prepared because he will do it. An empty cross tells us that no matter how much pain you've had, no matter how hard it got, choose to believe that if you're still here today, God is not finished with you yet. As a matter of fact, the Bible declares, eyes have not seen and ears have not heard. In other words, you've not even dreamt of the magnitude of God's goodness and God's power and God's blessings that he has in store for you. The Bible says, I know the plans I have for you. I'm saying to you, God is not done yet. So they are preparing after the sun has gone down. I want you to get the picture. They are getting ready for the next chapter in the dark. It's gotten dark, but they are still believing something better is on the way. For, for many of us, when life gets dark, we don't get ready. We give up. When, when we don't know what's going to happen, we throw in the towel. But these women believed God. And when it got dark, they trusted God, even though it got worse. I want you to understand that in Jewish culture, a new day begins when the sun sets, not when the sun rises. In other words, the new day starts when the sun goes down. And God is doing a new thing every time darkness comes over your life. When it gets dark, don't give up because that's when God is up to something. When it gets dark is the realization that a new dawn is about to break on your life. I shared with the ladies a few weeks ago when you go to the NAC or you go to the, 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 the theater, when the movie is about to start, how do you know the movie is about to start? The lights go down. The show is about to start. God's about to do his masterpiece. God's about to do something when it gets dark. 
So, so yes, the light has gone out in your life. You don't know what to do. But here is what I'm saying. Here is what these women are saying. Prepare for the next chapter. Because the darkness that you are in right now is a sign that God is getting ready to start a new chapter. Point number two. Purposefully remain obedient. You see, I, I want to make sure, and we have been doing this, and, and we did it last week. You see, when it comes to services like Good Friday, some people uh, do church because it's tradition. It's what we know. But the cross is meant to have meaning in our lives. So I'm trying my best to preach something that you can walk out of here more than just, I have fulfilled my Christian duty. I went to church at Easter. Purposefully remain obedient. What am I saying? I'm saying when it gets dark, when God seems unavailable, keep doing what God says to do. The Bible says they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandments. Remember the commandments, keep the, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. So even though Jesus is dead and their hearts are broken, even though that is not what they prayed for, they still obeyed God. Even though they did not get what they prayed for, they still obeyed God. What am I saying? Even when we are disappointed, still obey God. Even when we're in pain, still obey God. Even when God seems distant, even when it seems like God is not listening, remain obedient to his word. You see, as humans in seasons of extreme disappointment, we tend to excuse disobedience. We think God will give us a pass. God understands. God knows what we've been going through. No, when you think that way, you're only trying to convince yourself that you can live life on your own terms without abiding by God's words. Have you ever said, why pray if nothing changes? Maybe you didn't say it. Have you ever thought? Have you ever wondered, nah, 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 nah. Have you ever wondered why keep giving? Nothing's changing. I, I, I know you don't give it all. Because you don't see other people's lives are being changed. Why keep, have you ever wondered, why keep going to church, braving the bad weather or, or waking up early in the morning and nothing changes? We often excuse our disobedience because of our disappointments. And these women are showing us that even when life does not turn out the way we want it to, we should never abandon the principles of God. When your heart is broken, God's word still works. When life does not go your way, God's word still works. When you don't get your desires, the word still works. When you don't know what to do, the word still works. When you don't get what you want, the word still works. When things don't go your way, still love your neighbors as yourself. When life hurts, still trust in God with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. And in all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. The word still works. When the bottom falls out, still learn to pray without ceasing. Still wait on the Lord and be of good courage because he will strengthen your heart. The word still works. When pain and betrayal and relational conflicts come, still choose to forgive them that despitefully use you and choose to not fret yourself over evildoers. When life hurts, still choose to hold to God's hands and trust God because God's word still works. So when God seems unavailable, prepare for the next chapter and purpose to remain obedient. Point number three, purposefully let go so God can take charge. When God seems unavailable, prepare for what's next. Purposefully remain obedient. Purposefully let go so God can take charge. I want you to imagine these women, they, they, they loved Jesus and they, they want to show him their appreciation. And we can say this because one of them, I mean, we, we saw how, how passionate she was pouring that expensive oil and, and the, the measures to which she went. And so we can assume that they clearly wanted to do what was right by the Lord. They wanted to anoint his body. They wanted to lay their hands on the dead body. But the rules of the Sabbath says you can't touch him. 
Sometimes life will say to us, you, you, I know you want to get involved, but you can't. You should not. Sometimes God says to us, you've got to leave that alone. There will be moments when God says, take your hands off. There are going to be moments in life when God says, stop dealing with that. You can fix him. You can fix them. You can fix it. You can change that. You can save that. Take your hands off. That's hard, isn't it? Here's what happens. We often find ourselves wasting the resources of our lives trying to put our hands on something that God has told us to let go of. And you're asking God to heal you and to relieve you from stress and, and to save you from stuff that you keep bringing on yourself because you are keeping your hands on what God has said. Take your hands off from. Our best efforts are futile when God says, take your hands off. Our best efforts. Can I, can I, can I tell you something? And this is not a contradiction, but, 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 but fasting for a thing or, 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 or believing for it or doing something for a thing that God says, take your hands off, only will lead to your frustration and your disappointment in God. Am, am I making sense? I'm not saying don't fast. I'm not saying don't pray. But I'm saying when God says, take your hands off, you better take your hands off and say, God, what do I do? Fine, you don't want to put my hands, but where do I put my body? Where do I put my mouth? Where do I put my energies? It's hard news. But here's the good news. When you take your hands off what God tells you to take your hands off, God will put his hands on it. You, you, you've got to take your hands off for God to put his hands on it. Can I tell somebody, you've got to take your hands off for God to put his hands on them. You, you, you think the prodigal son... Was not giving issues at home. He was giving some issues. He didn't just wake up one day and started saying, I want out of here. But finally, the father says, you know what? I'm taking my hands off. You want to leave? Bon voyage. Am I making sense? And, and, and he, he, he decided to do something else with his body. He said, I'm going to put myself on the veranda and wait. I'm going to sit on the porch every day. Instead of trying to have conversations to convince you that you shouldn't leave and here is better for you. I'm going to sit. I'm going to let you go. And I'm going to sit and wait. Am I making sense? For when you return. We, we've got to learn to let go and let God have his way. God knows how to take care of things. Your hand is interfering with the hand of God. Somebody, your overworking is interfering with God's ability to bless you. I know you don't understand that, but it, God has a way of blessing you if you would follow his principles. Some of you, your family struggles. You, you're so engaged in it. You're so pressured and burdened by it. And God is saying, take your hands off. Stop trying to convince everybody of things of what's best for them. Our efforts often interfere with God's will. So we've got to learn to step back and let God have it. it was, I was reminded a while back that part of the reason you know a person is called to the ministry because they love to feed people. And so they reminded me that I love to feed people people in the natural, um, if you're around me and, and, and uh, it's a matter of time, the question comes up, do you want something to eat? And the Lord has helped me that I can open any fridge and find things and make something out of it. And I, I have some young adults to testify But sadly, I, one thing I want to make, I can't make, and that's bread. The other pastor in this church got that gift. <laughs> but I tried to make bread, and thank God for 
Sister Natalie and Sister Ophelia, it's always good. But deep in my heart, I know it's nothing but love that's speaking right now. Because after 20 minutes of that bread, it's hard as rock. But they say, it's good. <laughs> that's because I give it to them when it's hot. But, but, but here is something that I have learned in attempting to make bread. You need flour and yeast and water and salt and, and you got to mix all of that together. And, and your hands have got to get in there. And I'm not talking about people who put it in a machine and, hey, if that's what you do. But, but I mean, real bread, you know, you, you get your hands all up in there. You don't take the fork and twist it around, mix it up. No, no, no. You get all in there, all in your, you know, your nails and, 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 and you mix it all together. And, and you got to get your hands in it. But here's what I have learned. At some point, you've got to take your hands off. You got to take your hands out. You got to wrap that thing up and let the yeast make it rise. Let the yeast do the work. Because as long as your hand is in it, it'll never rise. It'll never be what it is supposed to be as long as your hand is in it. Because there's the possibility of over kneading the dough. Some of us have gotten hard spiritually because we've been over kneading. <clears throat> and God is saying, take your hands off. Let me give you number four real quick. Let me give you number four real quick. Prioritize assembling with the brethren. Yeah, I'm going there. Prioritize assembling with the brethren. What am I saying? Prioritize church. Because there's something. There's a reason why the Bible says, do not forsake the assembling together of the brethren. Do you think God did not know COVID was coming? Yet he said, do not forsake the assembling together of the brethren. Pastor, but we need to be wise. Yeah, but we don't even see you on Zoom. But I saw you at the grocery store. Hmm. But pastor, I need to eat. Man shall not live by bread alone. But every word that comes from the mouth of God. Prioritize assembling with the brethren. Listen, when the bottom of the barrel drops out, the Bible says they still kept the Sabbath. You know what happened on Sabbath? They went to church. They gathered with the brethren and they worshipped. Even though Jesus was dead, they still gathered and worshipped. I'm saying that even though your heart is broken, still come and worship. Even if it gets dark, still come and worship. Even if you don't know what's next, still come and worship. Even when Pilate has done you wrong, still come and worship. Even when you can't find a reason to worship, that's all right. Just lift your hands. Sometimes just showing up is the greatest act of worship. Even with no money, come and worship. Despite what the doctor says, come and worship. For true believers, church attendance and worship are not optional. You heard me, for true believers. For those whose names are certainly written in the Lamb's Book of Life and they know it. Church attendance and worship is not optional. For true believers, church is not just an Easter thing or a Christmas thing or a baby dedication event. True believers prioritize church affairs and Christian fellowship. Why? Because it reflects how much God is worth to us. So how much is God worth to you? Can I tell you something that I've learned? God's worth to me goes up when life for me goes down. When life begins to go downwards and I stick 
And I, 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 rem I, I, I remain obedient and I prioritize assembling of the brethren. All of a sudden, God's worth for me goes up. You know, when you are investing, they tell us that the best time to get in is when things are going down. Because you make more money than those who invest when it's rising. You see, those who invest when things are sinking realize that sooner or later, things have no choice but to go back up. And then the profit increases and the value increases. So when life seems on, when, when life hurts, when God seems unavailable, choose to prepare for what's next. In other words, get ready for what God is about to do. When it seems to get worse, when life seems to get worse, choose to purposefully remain obedient. Obey the word that works. After you've prayed and you've fasted and others have prayed for you and nothing changes, choose to purposefully let go so that God can take charge. Learn when to take your hands off. Even when things get dark, choose to prioritize the gathering together of the brethren. Choose to stay in connection with the brethren. Let's stand. With your heads bowed. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? Do you need to take your hands off some things? Do you need to take your hands off someone? Do you need to take your hands off a situation? Do you need to stop needing a particular relationship? Where is God calling you to return to obedience? Have you been praying for next but not preparing? Have you forsaken? Have you deprioritized the assembling together of the brethren? God can help you today. So, Father, in this moment, there are many of us who are in this place and elsewhere. And I know that there are many who are feeling that you are unavailable. Feeling that there is nothing else they can do. Prayed, fasted, made the right decisions for themselves. But, but God, you something has to happen so that things will work out best for them. And, and they just feel a sense of hopeless and despair. But God, I believe your hand is still mighty. I believe that for many of us, the story is not done. So God, teach us to step back so you can have your own way. Teach us what it means to prepare for what is next. Give us a vision, a glimpse, a reminder, a renewal that there is and next. Hmm. Father, teach us to worship you whilst we wait. Teach us to worship you even though we take our hands off. Because your worth goes up when our life goes down. Father, show us your might. Show us your power. And God, on this day in particular, we are reminded of just how powerful you are. Just how much you love us. Just how much you want to take us out and you want to take us through. So God, even in this moment, on this sacred and holy of days, 
as we begin to enter the season of Easter and as we begin to enter the biblical feast of Passover we pray God that you would do an exodus kind of move in the life of your people a breakthrough kind of move a setting free kind of move a coming out kind of move in the season somebody's coming out of relational conflict and financial struggles and health issues a coming out God in the name of Jesus greater than they went in yeah, yeah, somebody's bondage is being broken. The manifestation of broken bondage is about to be made sure in the name of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit. Do what you need to do and what you are capable of doing. Reassure a heart right now. Father, we have prayed these things in Jesus' name and now we give you praise now we give you worship now we give you glory that in spite of the challenges in spite of the difficulties we are declaring you are worthy you are wonderful you are amazing you are excellent you are magnificent you are majestic you are glorious you are lovely you are powerful you are great there is none like you you are the same God from morning till evening the rising of the sun until the setting down of the same you are the same God that raised Lazarus from the dead and brought Jesus back to life you are the same God that brought uh, Jairus' daughter back to life you are God you are God who heals you are God who sanctifies you are God who strengthens you are God who provides you are God who refreshes you are God who renews hey, you are God and we bless you we bless you we worship you oh hallelujah oh hallelujah oh hallelujah for you are great, you do miracles. Hallelujah. 